Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful morning it is and what a wonderful opportunity that we have been blessed on this great day to come together to sing praises with wonderful songs in which we have just been uh, singing, recognizing how great uh, our God is, isn't he? He is a truly awesome, truly wonderful and amazing God. As each of you know, today is one of those days in which many, for the first time this year, will be going uh, and to the place of worship to meet their God, hopefully to sing praises to Him and worship Him. Today is a day where many, for the first time this year, will dress in their very best to go through those doors and come and worship God, who is Almighty. Today is the day also, unfortunately, that many will walk out those doors not knowing God any better than when they came in. <coughs> Today is a day that many will focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so. It is the most important event in human history. But we'll forget of God's great love that He demonstrated from creation up until that point. I'm convinced that one of the reasons so many today do not love God like they should. One of the reasons so many today do not follow God when they walk out the doors where they have gathered to sing praises, study His Word, and recognize Him. I'm convinced that the reason for this is a lack of knowledge. A lack of understanding of who God is, His great majesty, his great wonder, His great love that is seen throughout time. And today we're going to look at and begin a series of lessons that is going to hopefully encourage our understanding of God's Word. I'm reminded of how important the Word is because God tells us over and over and over to remember His greatness, to reflect back through history, to know the things He has done for His people. God has said throughout the Bible from creation through revelation that He wants us to remember Him, to reflect upon Him. And for consistent faith in Him, it's based on a knowledge and understanding of Him. I'm reminded of what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The Bible is replete with passages like this and the importance of knowing and recognizing God. In Psalm 119 and verse 18, which is going to be the theme verse, if you will, of this series of lessons, it says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The hope of this particular series, as people come to reflect for maybe the first time this year all over the world, God, is that we understand and show, recognize, and teach God's wondrous love. That we know God from creation through revelation and understand who He is, that our eyes are open. And so today, we're going to, though the world will look at the resurrection, we're going to go back to the beginning where it all started. Where God's love, who is ultimately manifested in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, began at creation. Wherein God, our awesome God, created all things in the universe. And so if you have your hand out, let's begin by looking at the first point the created universe. When we look at the universe in which God created, when we examine the universe in which God created for every single one of us, we see the knowledge and the power of God 
in creation. God actually created the entire universe. We see in Genesis chapter 1 in six days, didn't he? In fact, we see in Exodus chapter 20 in verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God in six days created everything. The universe from the farthest extensions out to the closeness of the sand beneath our feet. God created the universe in six days. What does that tell us about God? though? How does that help us knowing this fact about God? What does His creation teach us about Him? What is it about his creation that can give us a glimpse into understanding him, knowing him better? Well, when we think about this question, it means our God is so amazing, so powerful, so wonderful, that by the breath of his mouth, by the willingness of his desire, he created over, as some have estimated, 100 billion trillion stars. Now let's just stop for a moment and reflect upon that idea. 100 billion trillion stars. That's a lot of zeros. One estimate I saw said 26 septillion. There's a 26 with 26, if I remember right, zeros behind it. Now of this 100 billion trillion, that's what is considered of the observable universe, the mathematical uh, estimation of the observable uni universe. Now think about that. In six days. Really in one when it comes to the stars, isn't it? He created each and every one of them. And yet, in all of that, God took the time to name them one by one, didn't he? In Psalm 147, in verse 4, he determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Not some. Not a few. Our God, who is so amazing, so magnificent, that in the universe, that outside of the earth, he could create 100 billion trillion plus stars and personally name them. I think in a sermon one time when I was trying to explain that, I said it's hard, it was hard for me and Christian to come up with names for Braden and Ashley. As parents struggle, what names are we going to? 100 billion trillion. Some of which are even in the scriptures. Where God tells us the names he has given when we look at this and we start thinking about this and the magnitude of it, we start examining the universe, the creation of God, we start seeing His power. We start seeing His might. We start seeing how truly amazing He is. The fact that God created the universe and all these stars only compounds all when you also realize that our God, the God whom we are here to worship this morning, also created all the animals in this world. Those that were and those that are. He created all of them. There's not uh, a, an ant on the ground or a whale in the sea that God did not have a hand in creating in those six days of creation. That God has not been watching over in His creation all these years. God is so amazing and so wonderful that He's created all of these. And, and it doesn't take much but just to look at some or even a few to see the amazing reality of God in His creation in just the animal kingdom. We see that God created a cheetah that could go 70 up to 70 miles an hour. You know, when we drop the bottom boys off, if it's not raining and stuff, a lot of times they like to get on the edge of their yard and as we back out, they work trying to race us. And the kids are always asking, how fast were we going? 
So Michael, he's got them long legs. He can get up there pretty quick. But it's not 70 miles an hour, is it? God is so amazing, he can create a cat that can do this. He's so amazing that he created a blue well that can be heard over 500 miles away. That could, in essence, swallow, swallow a few buses, <laughs> school buses. Look at that person, tiny, insignificant, compared to the creation of God. When we start thinking about our God and his creation, <clears throat> And thinking about how amazing it is, we can't help but, you know, look at his creation. The animals he creates would be in awe. The hawk can dive, at least this particular hawk, can dive at 200 miles per hour from the sky towards its prey. When we start thinking about the created universe of our God, when we look at just chapter 1 in and of itself, we see the power of God. We see the amazement of God. In six days, he created all of this. From the stars and the sky to the birds of prey in the air to every single one of us. He created us. You know, the human being the pinnacle of God's creation. It is an amazing wonder in and of itself. We could spend hours upon hours just looking at that alone. Just the facts concerning humanity. But I want to look at one thing in particular, and we'll, we'll move on from this point. I want to look at this and examine this, and that is the brain in which God gave us. The brain in which he created for us. When he created man. When we look at God's creation, when we look at us as humanity, when we look at us as mankind, the brain is one of those areas in which we can simply be in awe of God's understanding, His knowledge, and His ability to create. In 2013, so not too long ago, scientists discovered a way mathematically and with computers help to build a computer that could think as a human does for one second. In other words, the amount of information that the brain is able to compute, recognize, and spit out within one second of thinking, scientists were able to build a computer to do such. They succeeded in creating an artificial neural network of 1.73 billion nerve cells. This is a computer connected by 10.4 trillion synapses. All right, so as they looked at the human brain and they mapped out the human brain and the things it takes to do one second of thought, they built a computer to try to emulate that. 1.73 billion nerve cells is what they devised in this computer as they called it, 10.4 trillion synapses that they put together. And that sounds impressive. It sounds amazing. Even today, when I looked up those type of ideas, it is uh, mind-boggling of the amount of information that was going to be computed. And even if you take Murphy's Law and you go and double it, it doesn't take long to realize how impressive this is, which, by the way, technology hasn't been doubling since 2013. But remember this, and even though that sounds impressive, scientists have said if you compare it to the human brain, the human brain has... 80 to 100 billion neural network cells. And in fact, this computer that tried to simulate what the brain does in one second, it took 40 seconds. And this is one of the fastest computers ever made. You know, today, we can do amazing things with computers. I can talk to someone in China just like they're right here next to me. I can literally put on some goggles that are made and connect to the computer and it looks like I am there in another country. You can look up, down, spin around, you can see it all. And yet, that's not a fraction of a fraction of what God created in the human brain. 
And we're not talking about the mind. We're just talking about the brain, the organ. The mind which functions within, science has no explanation for. When we start talking about the created universe, when we start asking the question, what does it mean? It means our God knows the universe better than anyone. All things in creation, and that includes us. Why spend time looking at all these things? Why spend time considering all this in God's creation? Because it points to his knowledge of us. If he is able to do all this, what does he know about us? Which brings us to our second point, the purpose of the universe. You know, it's interesting that in science today, the question really has never been the purpose of the universe. They don't ask that question. They ask, where did it come from? Why is it here? In the sense of how did it get here, I guess would be a more accurate terminology. But they don't ask the true question, the real question, what is the purpose of the universe? Why are there over 100 billion trillion stars? Why are there hawks and winds and, and gravity and water and, and moons and planets? Why are there, why is all this in the universe? The purpose of the universe is us. From the farthest stretches of the universe, as far as anyone can comprehend, it all leads back to us. Everything works in unison. By the way, science doesn't deny that today. They don't like the conclusion for us, but they don't deny that it all works together. You take one galaxy, move it out of its place, the other galaxies fall apart. With gravity and all the laws that we know in existence today, we understand that it all works in unison, and yet, why does it do that? It is for the purpose of us, of mankind of me and you and everyone else in the world. God didn't just go about creating things just because he could. He was for an eternity before the universe. An eternity before the universe was created. He didn't create it just because he could or because he had an itch he wanted to fulfill. No, he created it for us. And we see this in creation. We see this in what God demonstrates in creation of how he created us, the things he did for us. We are different than everything else. We have one likeness to the universe, and that's our body. We are made up of the physical, aren't we? We have one other likeness, to creation, and that is in the animal kingdom spirit or life. But we are different than everything in creation when it comes to the fact that we have a third part to us, and that is soul. No animal has that. No physical outside of humanity has that. Paul would put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5. In verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. We're not like everything else. We're unique. We're different. We're not like the monkey or the elephant or the cheetah. I always kind of laugh at the though things are changing a little bit at those who would say, well, we came from monkeys because our DNA is so much like them, though our DNA to an earthworm is closer than that of a monkey. They just don't tell you that part. <laughs> but we're different. We're not like. The rest of creation know when God on the sixth day created man and then woman. 
He created us unique to in and of ourselves. We were unique not only because we have body, soul, and spirit, but because also we were created such in the image of God. Remember what God said in Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. When God was creating the universe for us, the hundred billion trillion stars, the planets, the asteroids, when he was creating all of that to bring about the perfect place for us to live and exist. He did so when he created us. He made us different than the rest. Not just body, soul, and spirit, but in his imprint, in his image. As much as we might love our dogs or our cats, our cows here, or our chickens, as much as we might love our animals, it doesn't compare with God. They don't and were not made in His image. There is not one person in this world who has ever been created that was not created also by God personally. Remember what the psalmist in Psalm 139, 13 said? You, or for you, excuse me, who's you? God. <coughs> David said, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. God personally breathes life, forms and knits us together, every single one of us. That's the God whom we serve. That's the God we want to know. That's the God who knows us. How does God know us so well? Because he's been involved since before we can remember. He's been involved in our lives since conception. He's been involved in our lives since we were known and before knowing what he was going to do. When we examine, when we think of this, and we ask the question, what does all this help us know about our God? It helps us know this important part, this important fact. God created the universe and all its amazing features. He individually creates each and every one of us for one reason, and that is because he loves us. He loves us and wants a relationship with every one of us. In John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only <laughs> begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We see the love of God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ all the way in creation. God didn't create any of us and this universe just because. He created the universe and us because he loves us and wants that relationship with us. No parent today has a child because they just can. In fact, anyone who spends any time at all thinking about the world we live in, probably would not have children. But why do we have children? Why do we help in the process of creation, creation of life? Why do we do that? Not because it even makes that much logical sense when you think of sin. It's because of love. 
God created us not because He had to. Not because He was required to. God created you because He wanted a relationship with you. Ashley, He wanted a relationship with you. Sadie, He wanted a relationship with you. Levi and Braden, Sophia, all of us here. God created us because He wants to have a closeness with us. He wants to be there for us. He wants to have this universal, this recognized love that parents know, that kids see in their parents. That's what God wants. From the very beginning, when God created time, the universe, and all that is in it, he did it because of love. God wants to have a better relationship with the world today, and that's why. <coughs> that's why Jesus died. That's why he gave his life, is because man stopped having a relationship with God. The reason why people have to celebrate today, and it's really a sad thing when you think about the reasons why, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whether the death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ, is because of our failures. He created the universe for us, and yet we more often than not as his creation turn our back on him. We come maybe once, twice, three times a year. The majority of his creation. We come when it's convenient, maybe when it's easy or easier. God created a universe for each of us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in six days, he established a universe for the pinnacle of his creation that was very good on the sixth day. He created an opportunity for those whom he created to have an everlasting relationship with him. In creation, we see his love. I'm convinced more people, if they really studied God's creation, if they really examined how amazing it is and how much love and thought was put into it, that it would challenge their relationship with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. As you reflect on your relationship today, as you think of your life up to this point, you know, today is a day that was not promised, isn't it? God has said that the sun will return like a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2. That though we don't know when he will come back, he continues on that we shouldn't be like those in darkness, but rather light, prepared for that moment. As you reflect on your life and the love of God that he has shown towards you, are you living in such a way that you are reciprocating that love, that you are trying to have the best possible relationship with your Creator? So that on that day, when the Lord returns, that you will meet Him in the sky. Whether having already passed and been in a paradise, awaiting that moment, or if by the time we walk out those doors, the, Lord's comes, the Lord comes back. Are you living your life in such a way that reflects your gratitude in God personally creating you? In Him personally forming you and knitting you together in your mother's womb? And then watching you, caring for you, hoping, patiently, 
2 Peter 3 and verse 9. That when we mess up, and we all will, that we recognize that, we come back to Him and start building on that relationship again. This morning, it might be the case <coughs> that as you reflect upon this, our God and His creation, as you think of the love He has shown you, I pray that it has swelled within you a knowledge and opened your eyes to the importance of His Word and what we can gain. The beauty that is found in His law, and trust me, though, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is the law of God. In other words, His love towards us. His avenue to be with Him forever. As you reflect on your life, are you drawing closer to him each day? Or have you been walking the opposite direction? If the answer is going the wrong way, let me encourage you as you reflect on your life. Let me encourage you to not allow another moment to pass, to not allow another second to go by where you don't go to God and ask for forgiveness if you've already obeyed his plan of salvation. Where you don't repent and seek to bear fruits of repentance and correcting, correcting, drawing closer to him in that. And then let us help you. If there's someone here who's been separated from Christ because of their sins, because they have not obeyed God's gospel plan of salvation, I'm reminded once again of what Isaiah says. It's our sins that separate us, isn't it? At the moment we can choose to not follow God or follow God and we make that choice to break His law. We go away from Him. We sever the relationship. Just like we talked about with the prodigal son this morning, it was the son who walked away from the father, wasn't it? But just like in that parable, the father's waiting for you to come back to Him. He accepts and has expectations of you because his son did so much for you. He emptied himself as God and became both man and God, dealing with the trials and tribulations of this world for you. As you reflect on your life, have you obeyed? Are you positive that you have obeyed God? Are you positive that you are right in the eyes of God? We can know we have eternal life. 1 John 5, verse 13. He says, I write these things so that you may know you have eternal life. Do you know it? If the answer is no, get together with someone here and start studying. If the answer is I'm not sure, get together with someone here and start studying the Word. The answer is yes. Get together with those you know who aren't and help them see the love of God in their lives. So it is, if there's someone here this morning who needs the prayers of this congregation, let us help you. Let us bear those things with you and help you by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.